Yes! If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, The Pope on Film. I mean, who is it nowadays? It's sweeping the nation. It is just a clean sweep. This segment is a janitor because it's just sweeping the nation. But only real fans, true hardcore fans that have been with us since episode one would know two facts about us, about the both of us, two undeniably really real and in no way made up on the spot facts about you and I, America's hottest podcasting couple, Bunny and Steve. First and foremost, Bunny, is that in your spare time, you are a screenwriter and a very successful one at that. Can you tell us, though, Bunny, why you only write Barbie animated direct-to-DVD movies? Barbie represents the ideal woman in a 50s patriarchal fantasy. Okay? So, so there is a lot to say about Barbie, the filthy fucking whore she is. Nice. Nice. That can only be told through Barbie animation. I really like I really like the movie that you wrote, Barbie in the Slime Bowl Bolarama. Yes. I really like that one. That was a good one. Yes. That that was a thank you. Um, there was also Barbie has cooties. Yeah, uh, I was I was pretty proud of that one. Uh, that was a horror movie. Um, uh, it's not beach sand Barbie scratching. You that know was that movie. was that was uh, that was a uh, that was actually supposed to be a children's movie. You know, hmm. but things just didn't pan out. That's all I say. I, you know, I want to say. All of the lawsuits have been settled, nice. so we could drop it now. Yeah, okay, good. Good, good, good. Glad to hear it. And the second fact that you would know about me is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a storyteller. So what I like to do at this part of the podcast is find a story from the history books, maybe one that people don't know too well, and reword it via my own unique storytelling style, and that's what this is, another educationally uneducational installment of Steve's Historic Approximation! Dun, 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 dun. Or Shap, as I like to call it, repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone wants me to or not. Personally, I like the name Shap, and, uh, hey, fun fact for you. If you work for IBM, then SHAP stands for the Special Health Assistance Provision, which is a program that reimburses you for any medical work you may have that happens to be out of network, which is nice, but you do have to fill out the proper SHAP form, which is available at acclarisonline.com. Be sure to fill it out completely. That is very important. Anywho, this week on the old Shappity Shap Shap, we will be discussing a <coughs> war that <coughs> broke in Australia in 1932, which will sound fake, but I swear it 100% happened. And this this Shap does have a twist at the end, a Shyamalan. Okay. So be prepared for the Shyamalan at the end. Really gonna uh, just kick you in the jimmies. Uh... And for those of you wondering, hey, what is Australia? Let me tell you, uh, it's just a part of New Zealand. Yeah. Not a lot of people have heard of it, have heard of Australia. Australia, what's that? Oh, it's an island near New Zealand. Okay, 10-4. See what I'm doing? But, they're, people... but their accents are really fairly different. Yes. Which yeah. is interesting. And for Christ's sakes, Gutenberg, Steve Gutenberg, was right about the New Zealand accent in that stupid-ass movie, I forget what it was called, he was in. 
Casablanca? Huh? Was it uh, The Passion of the Christ? It was not Passion of the Christ, although Steve Gutenberg was excellent in that. Steve Gutenberg uh, played Jesus, and then Judas was played by Michael Winslow doing funny sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> As they're nailing Jesus to the cross, he's making uh, nail noises with his mouth, and the guy banging the nails looks at the hammer like, am I doing that? And then, oh, <laughs> Judas! Yeah. Yeah. You can see the whole thing. Yeah. It, yeah. That was uh, wonderful. Good. Go ahead. That was absolutely wonderful. A lot of people lump New Zealand with Australia, but I'm switching that up. So Australia is just a part of New Zealand. Uh, okay, funny. You can you can put. New uh, Zealand gave us Lord of the Rings. And Australia gave us Crocodile Dundee. More importantly, New Zealand gave us one of the greatest lines in the history of movies. I kick ass for the Lord. Uh -huh. One of my favorite lines from a movie where a priest in a New Zealand cemetery is fighting what are basically zombies. Anyway. Yes. Also, New Zealand gave us Flight of the Concords and the Sodomy song. From the end of Meet the Feebles, which yes. is one of my favorite musical numbers in the history of mankind. You can put up slide A, buddy. The first one. You can Exhibit put that one up. A. So, okay. So, we're talking about Australia in this shack. Let me set up... Uh, let me set up the story for you. The year is 1919. The First World War is over, and all of the soldiers are returning home. Uh, and in Australia, apparently what the Australian government did is like, hey, there's a world war. And if it's a big hit, they're going to do a school. So you should go out and fight the war for us. And the Australian people are like, hey, bye, bye, cracky. I don't know. Uh, and they were also told that there was no pay and they were doing it for the exposure. Kind of. Kind of. Yeah. You're, you're actually, like, on the money. And the Australians are like, what will you do with us, for us? What will you do for us if we go and fight this war? And the Australian government says, we will give you land. And you will become landowner. We will give you free land if you fight in this world war. Now go and risk your life for us, please. So it's the end of World War I. All of the soldiers are returning home, and they go, Hey, Australia, we're back from the freaking war. A bunch of us died. Anywho, uh, you promised all of us soldiers land, so where's our land? And the government points to an empty field, which there is a lot of in Australia, and says, Here you go. And the soldiers are like, um, what the fuck is this? And the, uh, the government goes, it's farmland. Didn't we tell you? You're yes. all fucking farmers now. Yeah. You're now officially farmers, and this nation needs wheat? So go be farmers and grow us some wheat. Don't worry if farming is too hard for you veterans. We will totally be paying you in subsidies. Well, spoiler alert, Australia didn't pay a single subsi subsidy to the veterans. I think a dingo ate their subsidies. Yeah. Actually. Now that I think about it, a dingo ate your subsidies. So just imagine you fight in World War I. You face horrors, atrocities. Your friends die in your hands. You are holding your dead friend and his his intestines are spilling out of his body and you're trying to keep them in his body and just the blood and guts and intestines are flying out of your hands and finally you come home having seen such horrors and atrocities that you will never forget and the government says congratulations you're a fucking farmer now hey we'll pay you and then they never pay him yeah like that's 
really fucked up. And so the 1920s were a very angry time with all of the forced veteran farmers growing wheat and then not getting paid the subsidies they were promised. The farmers are pissed, and every year they get more and more pissed, and they keep threatening to just stop farming. They're going to start the means of production. There's going to be a goddamn communist uh, uprising in freaking Australia. Uh, hey, Australia, hope you can live without wheat, because uh, us forced veteran farmers are getting real fucking pissed off over here. So this is the setting. So... It's 1932, and the veteran farmers are getting their wheat crops set up, while also threatening to not grow any wheat, because fuck the Australian government for not paying them. That is when the enemy arrives. Growing wheat. I don't know how much you know about wheat growing. We're still on slide A, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. But we will be switching soon. I don't know how much you know about wheat growing, Bunny, but growing wheat requires a buttload of water. Just a ton of water. And in Australia, you know what? You know what's in Australia? Well, well, number one, Australians. Number two, koalas, and apparently they all have STDs. Yeah. And then number three. There are emus. Yes. The second largest living bird. Uh, second only two. Can you tell me what is the largest bird? The ostrich. No, big bird. Big bird. In Sesame Street. Who is an ostrich, is he not? No, no. He's just a big-ass bird. And there's just one of them. So it goes big bird, and then emus and ostrich. And then and the rest. All the yeah. other birds are just are just hands arrested like the professor and Marianne. Emus are native to Australia, huge ass birds, fast runners, wobbly bodies, wobbly heads, wobbly necks. Good luck catching an emu. Yeah. They are fat. They and are very strong. aggressive, I have heard. They, yeah, they are super aggressive. And so this is what happens in Australia. Every year the emus have a breeding season. Emu sex, a big Australian emu orgy. Uh, and then afterwards, they go, Phew, good orgy, everyone. Really good uh, sexing. Now let's go to the coastline, because there's a shit ton of water at the coastline. So we're going to walk to the coastline. We can hydrate for a few months, and then finally, when we're rehydrated, it's orgy time again. So that's, that's an emu's year, okay? But I'd, what I'd like to think happened was, it's 1932, and this time around, there's an emu who thinks outside of the box. Yeah. This would be the emu Robin Williams would voice if they made a movie. He's like, no, I'm going to go a different route, you know? Let's call him Barry. Barry the emu. And he goes, you know what? I'll meet you emus at the coastline. I'll meet you there. Because I always go the same route with you guys, and it's crowded, and there's just a bunch of us. Like, I need space. I'm going to go the long route. You guys go that way. I'm going to just go over here and just get into an adventure, see what I can do. Uh, wander the earth like Kane and Kung Fu. I'll meet the rest of you guys down there. And so Barry the Emu goes off on his own. He's the first one to notice it. Uh, so you can, you can move it to us like B now. Move it to slide B. So Barry goes off on his own and he searches, he goes off in search of just fun and see what things he can see. So Barry the Emu is the <coughs> first one to notice it. Barry the Emu is the first one. Okay? So he runs to the coast. He meets up with the others. And he's like, guys, 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 you know how how, how we we uh we have our big and then we walked all the way to the coastline so we could get water. Uh, I found these farms, and they have a shit ton of water. So if we just go to the farms, we don't have to go all the way to the beach. And everyone's like, oh, man, we don't have to freaking walk all the way over here? No, fuck it. Okay, let's go. And this is true. Remember, in 19... Remember... 100% true. In 1932, 
the emus descend upon Australia's farmers. Over 20,000 emus! Oh my god! Descend like a biblical plague on Australia's farmers. Basically, imagine the American Dust Bowl. To put yes. an American perspective on it, because we need a, an American perspective on everything in, in America. So just imagine the Dust Bowl in the United States, but imagine the dust is also pecking your face and taking huge dumps everywhere. Just imagine the Dust Bowl, but it can also scratch your eye out. Yeah. And then there you go. So that's what they're dealing with. So overnight, the forced veteran farmers of Australia have their farms, their crops, their freaking everything just totally decimated by 20,000 emus. It's an emu army. Suddenly the entirety of the nation's farmland is destroyed in one fell swoop by the 20,000 emu ar army overnight. What is Australia to do? So the farmers meet with the government and a deal is made. And it's like, hey, government, you have to do something. Send in the troops, send in people, because we've, we've got nothing. We have been destroyed. And Australia's like, well, you know, I don't know if we're going to do it, because we have a long history of fucking over you farmers. I mean, you guys will have to meet us halfway. What's in it for us? And so a deal is made. If the, vet, the forced veteran farmers provide food and lodging and pay for ammunition, Huh, I'm just going to repeat that a second time for no yeah. good reason. If the farmers pay for ammunition, yes. then Australia would send in the entirety of the Australian army to fight the emu men. Hence, the name, the official name, the 1932 emu war. An actual thing that actually happened. So the way that I see it in my head is just imagine, if you will, a desolate patch of Mad Max type land, which I assume is like 40% of all of Australia. You know, uh, just a dirt road and some mountains and some guy strapped to the front of a vehicle that's on fire. Yes. And uh, just, you know, all you see is dust and dirt and uh, occasionally a thunderdome. And so, yes. now imagine farmland there in the middle of nowhere, uh, but instead of farmers, it's angry fucking veterans. In yeah. my mind, I think of a farmer as like, you know, this old withered white man, and oh, my father gave this farm to me, and he got it from his grandfather. He's in, he's in touch with the land. Yeah, and times are hard. He harmonizes with nature. And he's one of those people where it's like, huh, is the wheat ready? Huh, let me pick up one stalk and smell it. Hmm, let me lick it a little bit. Uh, two more weeks. A, a classic farmer is a nurturer. And he picks up the soil and he rubs it in his hand spills a little bit, and he's like, huh, it's going to be a good crop this season. Yes. Maybe he puts a little bit of dirt in his mouth, like chew between his gums and his, and his lip, and he's like, mmm, that's good dirt. We're going to have a good, we're going to have a good, he's up at like 4.30 every morning Yeah. to start doing the work, but then when I imagine uh, farmers in Australia, uh, they're all Michael Rooker. Yeah. You know? They're all just like pissed, and at any moment they'll shoot you, and their arms are covered in tattoos of naked prostitutes they bang. Okay, I think I, I think I got it. They're the chain gang from Cool Hand Luke. Yeah, yeah. Those they're the all out in the show. fields with, with, with hoes and they're digging trenches, they're turning over the land, they're getting ready to plant, but they are not fucking happy about it. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy to think of 
how uh, farmers in Australia, especially in the 1930s, differ from your idea of an American farmer. So imagine desolate wasteland in the middle there's farms, and in those farms there are angry, pissed off veterans. Now imagine 20,000 emus on the land fighting uh, veterans of World War I, but now imagine the Australian army fucking tanks and jeeps and machine guns rolling in to fight the emu menace. And here's the thing though, um, they're like, oh, this will be easy. We've got guns, we've got rifles, we've got machine guns. We are just easily going to decimate this emu army. Emus are fast as fuck. Yes. They you can didn't you, it to, They're you can like one of the fastest to, land animals, right? Didn't yeah. you say that before? Yeah, yeah they're fucking yeah. fast as shit. You can move it to slide C. Emus are fucking huge. They are huge. And they're fast and they're running like a son of a bitch and they're angry and they will attack you. They will fucking decimate you. And then they've got wobbly ass necks. There is a surprising amount of emu war fan art out there. Yeah. A lot. And this uh, picture right here, this is, uh, this right here, this is one of them. Uh, just a random one that I found that I'm really happy with. But, uh, so not only are they fast. Yeah, they're, 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 they're like, emu were kind of like the badgers of the bird world. Yeah. You yeah, know, also got they can call yeah. geese pussies. Yeah. They've also got their head on a swivel. they got that rotating neck that's just wobbling all over the place. So in the first six days of the Emu War, the army had already used a fourth of their total ammunition. They already were running out of ammunition and needed more ammunition after only six days. But the, the army said, hey, don't worry, though, we've, we've, gone, we've done good. We have killed, uh, let's see my notes here, 200. Yeah. Now, remember, there's 20,000, and they're here talking about how they used a fourth of their total ammunition and only killed 200 birds. So they've wasted a ton of ammunition for a very ridiculously small amount of dead emus. And don't forget the veteran farmers who are getting screwed over by the government. They're the ones paying for the ammunition that the army is wasting trying to kill emus with fucking machine guns. Yes. Apparently, it's, it's really difficult to kill an emu with a machine gun. It's just moving all over the place. Even with a thousand bullets in your machine gun, good luck trying to shoot emus in a pack of emus. Yeah. Emus. Okay, that is that is a weird way to combine the 1932 Emu War and the Matrix, but okay. Yes, they they are fast. Yes, like Neo. There you go. Hey, and, and they're they're emus. I mean, yeah. can't you come up with a better way of dealing with emus? I mean, shit, you might have had a better job of just putting two swords in your hands and just moving around in a circle. You might yeah. have a better job killing emus that way than with a freaking machine gun. By day seven, over 2,500 rounds of ammunition have been used, and uh, the army said that between 200... To 500 emus had been killed, but other people at the time, including some of the farmers, they were like, uh, hey, don't listen to the army. They only killed like 50. Yes. So, depending on who you believe, they killed anywhere from 500 to 50 emus. Meanwhile, the media is having a field day with At this. At a 20,000? Yeah, out of 20,000, they killed somewhere between 500 to 50 emus in a week, and they used over 2,500 rounds of ammunition. The media's front page headlines in Australia, uh, government losing war to birds. <laughs> birds defeating Australian army. 
So the military arrived on November 2nd, 1932 to start the Great Emu War and retreated on November 8th, 1932. The army retreated. Oh, man. And the veteran farmers are all like, um, excuse me, we're still, we're still dealing with an emu demic over here. Can you help us out like you said you would? So on November 12th, the Australian army is like, fucking fine, we'll go back. Okay, round two. Uh, and they resumed the emu war. And I just love the visual image of Australian soldiers in combat vehicles killing emus with machine guns. Yeah. You know? Like, I, and I know that this is like a stereotype, but I'm just going to come out and say it. You might have had better luck with Boomer. Yeah. You know? You might have had better luck at defeating the emus. You know? I mean, I mean okay, okay. Yes, I understand they're emus, and yes, I understand they're very fast, but like, if they're traveling as a, in a big pack as the previous screen suggested yeah. like it seems like you don't even really have to aim yeah. you but, know you but, shoot yeah, in the pack and you you will be mowing down emu so what is yeah, the problem you here that. you huh? would think that you would think that but yeah. apparently it's much harder than that apparently once you show up with your uh, jeep still with the uh, turret gun Jesse Ventura used in Predator, they start running like a motherfucker in all different directions. It's not like, oh no, they're shooting at us, let us move in a pack away. Apparently what the emus do is, shit, these ones They scatter. Guns, scatter. Yeah. And then they just go their own way. And so now the Australian army is forced to try and focus on one, but like, good luck shooting one. <laughs> and yeah, apparently it's fucking hard as shit to kill an emu with a machine gun. Who knew? Yeah. Apparently Australian veterans did. Anywho, they killed some, but obviously not all. And by December of 1932, the news of the Australian emu war started traveling all over the globe. And scientists in Europe came down hard condemning Australia, saying... Essentially, what is happening is the Australian government is trying to eradicate an entire species of birds, and the birds are winning, and we've got to err on the side of the birds here. We cannot yeah. let this stand. Over, it, by the, near the end of the Great Emu War, over 10,000 rounds of ammunition were used to kill only... 900 of the 20,000 emus. And the, the public blowback over this failed emu war was so great, the public outcry was so huge, that uh, at the end of 1932, the Australian government officially stopped their war on emus. So to reiterate, Australia declared war on emus! And emus won! Yes. Like, who can beat the Australian army? Apparently, a couple of birds can. See, I, I still don't understand why... I mean, it sounds just to, just to build the poor, you know? Yeah. But it just doesn't make sense for the military. It's like, well, you know, you're the farmers on the land. You are the ones with the emu problem. You're a trained fighting force. Yes, we will help you by sending you guns and ammunition, but there will be a fee for that. You know, I mean, and just put it on the farmers to fight off the emus. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you would think that. that. I mean, that's a good idea. It's better than sending the freaking army to go fight emus, apparently. I mean, now, I mean, they are, in effect, a trained army already, and they know the land. Yeah. 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 I gotta get me one of those signs. Yeah, I just made it. I'm really, I'm really proud of it. At, at the present moment, right now, in 2021, there are over 700,000 emus having emu orgies all over Australia. 
Uh, why? Because they won the great Emu War of 1932. Shit, they can have all the sex they want. Yeah. Oh, you earned it, Emus. And, and, which, of course, is where the expression as easy as shooting an emu came from. You know that classic expression? I have like, oh, never heard need, that. Oh, we need to climb this mountain? This will be as easy as shooting an emu. It's not an expression, but I'm hoping to start it. Okay. I think uh, that we definitely should start it. Now, I, I, I agree. I just want to point out that we... We did not have a lot of success with It's a Pippin. Oh, yeah. It's a Pippin. Uh, yeah. Yes. Now, that was an odd story. The story of the Great Emu War. That was an odd story, sure. But it gets odder. Because Hollywood has come a-knockin'. Okay. And they are currently working on a movie entitled The Great Emu War. A script has already been written with a hopeful release date of late 2022. The script was written together. And now you can switch it to the last picture, Bunny. Because this is shocking. The script for The Great Emu War was written by the screenwriting team of John Cleese and SNL's Rob Schneider. What the fuck? <laughs> Is what? that who that other guy was? This blows my mind. Yeah. I I man, I I can only help hope that please can keep him reined in. My mind boggles at this. My Ooh. mind boggles at the fact that, and it's not like, oh, uh, John Cleese is in London and uh, Rob Schneider is licking Adam Sandler's asshole somewhere, and they meet together over Zoom, yeah. and they hash out their scripts, and then they write the scripts separately or something, and then they combine them. No, they met and worked on this together in the same room. Three people wrote it. The third person is some Australian comedian who I've never heard before, and he teamed up with John Cleese and a uh, freaking the copy machine guy from SNL. Yeah. And together, they wrote the script for the great Emu War. This blows my goddamn mind. And it's kind of sad, too, because it's like, oh, why would John Cleese write with Rob Schneider? And it's like, oh, well, actually, with the way that society is right now, what you should be saying is, Rob Schneider? Why would he ever work with someone like John Cleese? Yeah. Because John Cleese has turned into a, a real asshole as time goes by. Right now, he is work he's also working on a movie that will tackle the biggest uh, subject that is plaguing mankind right now. Cancel culture. So, John Cleese is really... Which, I, I, I don't know. I, you know, I mean, it's possible that could surprise us. I... I don't have a whole a whole that a whole hell of a lot of hope, you know. I think it's gonna be what I'm kind of afraid it's gonna be, you know. But eh, I don't know. I I, I would yeah. hope John Cleese is intelligent enough that cancel culture is not really a fucking thing, and no, it is no, no different than ruining. what humans have always done. No, uh, cancel culture is what is ruining uh, society right now. It is horrible that that you just say one horrible joke or say one horrible thing in America and uh, society cancels you. He probably came up with that while hanging out with his close personal friend, J.K. Rowling. 
And uh, I can see why uh, John used to be against cancel culture, because remember his amazing show, Faulty Towers? Oh, man, that show was hilarious. I loved the parts where the stupid Spaniard said something stupid because he couldn't speak the Queen's English like normal people. Ha! Ah, foreign people are so stupid. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, John, yeah. please... John Cleese and his best friend J.K. Rowling are trying to fight against cancel culture. So, uh, Rob Schneider is looking like the best one in this group at, the point, at this point. When, time, you know? when hasn't this fucking existed? You know, I mean, I lived through Procter and Gamble, motherfucker. You know? A pack of fucking right wing evangelicals decide that the Procter and Sam, Sam Gamble symbol is satanic. And it's all over the fucking news. I mean, I would cry if it wasn't a big corporation. Yeah. But they it, it hurt their business. Wah, wah, I don't give a fuck, but... Is that not cancel culture? Yeah. And where did that come from? Yeah, what crazy. drove the entire satanic panic, which was all about cancel culture? Yeah. You know, so like, please, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And since we're on the topic, I've been kind of meaning to give a shout out to Seth Rogen you know why because uh, he had he had done a series of interviews and he covered kind of a lot of topics you know I think it was like a quick interview kind of a thing and one of them is that he was he was asked about cancel culture and things like that and he was like you know I'm sorry but comedy changes and I'm sorry if comedy is changing right now, but that is how it is. What you're calling cancel culture is things that people just aren't finding funny anymore. Yeah, and the and the far right and the far right keeps saying that cancel culture is ruining America. And to be clear, I I, I want to say that again. Uh, the far right who has previously tried to boycott Apple, Target, Disney, Netflix, the NFL, Geico, Wells Fargo, Campbell Soup, Starbucks, Macy's, Pepsi, Archie Comics, Nordstrom, Amazon, Marvel Comics, Ben & Jerry, Anheuser-Busch, Amazon.com, and American Girl Dolls. They're so sick of cancel culture. Yeah. So, it's yeah. awful. It's awful. And but, shit changes, man. Some yeah. things just aren't as funny anymore, regardless of the reason. Like, like I, I find a big form of my whole humor is stupid outrage. Yeah. You know? Getting mad over nothing. Getting over the top mad. I've, I can't think of an example, but I've done it a million times. Yeah. Well, these days, that only works if you know me. Yeah. Or else people just think I'm stupid. Yeah. Because there are so many... I can't top people taking horse dewormer. <laughs> You know, my stupidity has a hard time matching the fucking reality. You yeah. know? And I, I get it. I'm not blaming anybody. If somebody else said it that I didn't know, I would think they were a fucking moron. Yeah. You know, so like, I'll do something like that and like, you'll laugh, Jeannie will laugh, a couple of friends on Facebook would laugh, but everybody else would think I'm a fucking moron. Yeah. You know? Like, if I started talking about and getting outraged about Joe Biden being a clone, which I could certainly do, I could probably do a good five minutes on that. Uh, but anyway, 
Yeah. It's a joke. It's a big fucking joke. But like, <sighs> motherfucker, it's already been done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. So yeah, I understand what you're saying. I I I I don't like the screaming about cancel culture because your shit is stale. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. So. So that's the story of the great emu war, a war that Australia fought against emus and then emus won. So that's why in World War II, the first thing that Hitler did is unleash his army of trained emus. Yeah. And that's why Hitler took over so many nations, because all of the Nazi soldiers were writing emus. Uh Uh-huh. And so all of the Russian and Australian soldiers are like, shit, we can't shoot the Nazis. They're moving too fast. Damn it. Well, now, did they, did they then ride those emu to Antarctica (laughs) where they had met the very large quote-unquote Nordic-type aliens? Who are teaching them how to build flying saucers? Fucking probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. Next week we will be talking about uh, on Shaft. We will be talking about uh, one of the the greatest, the second greatest baseball player. Because everyone knows that the greatest baseball player is Doc Ellis. Yes. Just who we have discussed on the podcast before. Yes, but, we have. Uh, I have found the number two greatest baseball player of all time, and we're going to be telling his story next week. So join us next week for more educationally uneducational fun with Steve's Historic Approximations! And cut on that.